Hey guys, I have another special guest, uh, Professor Noakes uh, from South Africa, a South African scientist, uh, professor of exercise science and sports medicine, author of many books that I have. I'm really excited to talk to you today. So welcome from South Africa. What time is it over there right now? Just past two o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so, and, and what day is it? Yeah, <laughs> I'll have to think. It's Thursday. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay, great. So, um, I, I want to first uh, talk about, um, you, you at one point promoted the high carb diets for a while, right? Tell, tell me a little bit about, while. yeah, tell me a little bit about that. And then I think what changed your mind? So I started running in the late 1960s, early 70s, and I started my physiology training in medicine in 1970. And that was the, one of the first years that the new theory arose that muscle glycogen, i.e. carbohydrates in the muscle, was the single, notice the single factor determining athletic performance. Wow. And that's how it was projected to all of us. And so now I'm a young student studying physiology and medicine, and I'm running marathons, and I discover this, and that this is the most exciting piece of information I I heard in the whole medical training. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was started promoting this high carbohydrate diet in the 19, early 1970s. And I, I then, of course, adopted that diet. And then I went and did my medical training, completed my medical training. And I was surrounded by cardiologists who were so telling us that if you eat fat, you're going to die. So I was going to eat lots of carbohydrate and it was going to make me run better. Well, in fact, it made me run worse and I got fatter and progressively sicker. And then in 1981, my father was diagnosed with type two diabetes and he died 10 years later. And eventually I discovered that I also had type two diabetes. Wow. And I realized I've got 10 years to sort this problem out or else I'm gonna die like he did. And that fortunately forced me to look very seriously into the, what was going on in the evidence. And I came across a book called the new Atkins for the new for a new you, written by doctors Westman, Volick, and Finney. And within two hours of reading that book, I said, "Oh my gosh, I got it completely wrong for 33 wow. years." Wow! And within two hours, I changed. I started changing my diet, and the results were spectacular. And I haven't looked back for seven and a half years. So that's how it all started. And then. Initially, I was very reluctant to say anything about it because I knew there'd be a backlash and I knew that I would be vilified, but I didn't realize the extent to which I'd be vilified. And so I was very cautious initially, but then eventually it came out and then the problems arose. And then my, fat, my, my colleagues attacked me and that's been seven years of attacks. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I, yeah, I saw that. That was ridiculous. Do you, yeah. do you, now, do you, do you find that... Um, these, the, the more educated someone is, educated, the harder it is for them to learn new concepts, new ideas? Chris, that's a really good question. What I discovered was that the academics in hospital practice are the ones who are most ingrained because they've been bought by the pharmaceutical industry. And what they say is controlled by industry, although they don't understand it. And so they are the ones who are really, really tough. The, the guys aren't in general practice, the, the academics and the, the, the doctors in general practice are much more open because they've got to treat patients and make them better. But if you're working in a hospital, it actually, the pay, you don't have a sort of direct relationship. You see all these thousands of people, but you don't have a direct person to person relationship with the individual patients. But if you're running your own private practice, you do. So, so what's going to happen is that the change is going to occur in, in the private sector of medicine, where, where doctors have to face up to their patients. But in the public sector, there's still a long way to go because there's so much resistance to change. Oh, yeah, I know. I, I run into that all the time. Um, I want to talk about, your, you wrote this book on waterlogged, which is fascinating because there's this whole... I don't know. It's like one of those things that everyone knows that you need to drink a lot of water, or drink more water, keep drinking water. Where did this come from? Is it just made up? Uh, that's a great question because, again, when I started running, we used to run marathons and you allowed one drink sort of thing. That was what you were allowed. <laughs> wow. 
I, I can, and, and you had to provide your own, own drinks. And in fact, that was one of the first things I also started activating on. So when I was running, I was telling the authorities, no, you must give us more drinks for our races. And within 10 years, it changed dramatically. And then from getting a drink every like 15 or 20 kilometers, that's what it originally was, it came down to every mile, every 1.6 kilometers that you were drinking. Wow. And then, then what happened was the sports drink industry took off and they made sure that they were going to drive this. And so various companies, one in particular, which we won't name and shame at this stage because it's all in the book, anyone can right. read it. Right. But this one particular company realized that actually the marathon owners aren't the ones who are going to drink all their drinks. It's the person going to the gym. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to tell the person going to the gym that if they do one minute's exercise, they could die if they don't drink. And that's the message they got out. Wow. It, and it, it's unbelievable. But they then said that dehydration is a disease. And it's not. It's a biological response, as you know. They said dehydration is a disease. And if you become dehydrated, you can die. And it's going to affect your performance. And so they man managed to sell this to millions and millions and millions of people who are working out in the gym for 10 minutes that they must drink a lot and so on. And so that's what happened. But then when you transferred that to marathon running and you told people to drink ahead of thirst and you provided so much fluid during these races, because remember, there was nowhere else in the world where you could get so much free fluid for the four or five hours that you ran a marathon. You could drink and drink and drink. And of course, people overdrank and, and some died. And we predicted that it would be an American female runner who would die. And that happened in 1993. It was absolutely as we had predicted. Wow. And so, so that was, it's again, it was industry. Industry brainwashed people to believe. And that's, again, the problem we have with our nutrition story. Industry brainwashed us to believe certain things, which is simply not true. Hey, for those of you who are watching, what we're talking about is when you drink too much water, you're going to dilute certain electrolytes, especially potassium. and um, what's going to happen is you need potassium for the heart to work, to balance fluids in the brain. So if you drink too much water, it's called hyponatremia, right? And uh, your brain can swell. It can really be dangerous. And it can die. And there, right. there are at least 15 deaths in runners and triathletes and, and particularly in the military, which is really interesting because the, the biggest incidence has been in the military. And they finally, finally, finally this year, so that we described the condition in 1981, and now it's 2018. The first time in, in history, the US military said, if a patient comes in and you think they've got a heat illness and they're confused, you may not give them fluids until you measure their blood sodium concentration. Wow. Now, that, we did that in 1985 or 86. Wow. That's how long it takes for change to occur. So just so you guys know, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Noakes is the key, the top researcher on this data, exercise-associated hyponatremia. You've done uh, some, some articles on this research a lot, right? Yeah, we were the first to describe it. It occurred in a lady in the 1981 Comrades Marathon, which is a 90-kilometer, 56-mile race in South Africa. And she wrote to me after the race because she'd been unconscious for four days. So here she starts this race completely healthy. And then she's unconscious. And she wrote to me a week later or so when she'd regained consciousness. She said, what happened? She wow. said, all I know is my sodium went down. And so then we knew the hyponatremia. And that was the first case. And we collected a whole series of cases. And just by talking to the patients, you could see that they drank a lot. And wow. there was clear evidence that one of them, for example, was a lady with anorexia nervosa who was very sensitive about her weight. And she said, but you know, Prof, I put on four kilograms during this Ironman and I knew I had to believe her because she would be, you know, she would know what your weight change was. And another guy told me he'd passed like about six liters of urine in recovery. <laughs> so then we were getting an idea. Then we did, a, we did an, an investigation where we hospitalized eight patients with the condition. These people were near death in the Comrades Marathon. And we, recovered, we studied them during recovery and we could show that they all passed an excess of urine. And that average, the worst case was a guy who had excreted six liters of extra fluid. So he'd increased his body weight by six kilograms. Wow. So that was, 
So then we knew, and we published that paper in the, in the Journal of Applied Physiology, and I thought, well, that's the end. We've proved what causes it. It's going to go away. Well, actually, no, because there were scientists who were being encouraged to say that this was nonsensical research and dehydration is the real problem. And if you tell people to underdrink, they'll all die of dehydration. That, that was the argument. And industry was driving it. And then the American College of Sports Medicine brought up the new guidelines in 1996. And they said, you must drink ahead of thirst, essentially to drink as much as tolerable. That was the ruling. That was the advice. And there's, there's no biology that, that tells you that you must drink to as much as tolerable. Right. So, so we have to drink, drink when we're thirsty, right? That's the common sense type solution. Yeah, absolutely correct. And uh, that's how all animals drink. And so why should humans be different? But we, right. because we've got this brain, we think well, we must do something with the brain. Well, no, actually, the body will tell you what to do. <laughs> exactly. Um, since we're talking about fluids, um, what about long distance uh, running and electrolytes and cramping. Um, um, yeah. You talked about it in some of your books. Can you touch on that? Yeah, well, we did quite a lot of studies to try and see if people who were cramping were dehydrated or had lost more sodium or were, had low sodiums, and we never found it. However, it's remarkable that many people benefit by taking salt. And so... So this is the paradox that we can't show that you have a salt deficiency if you're cramping. And certainly when you go on the high fat diet, a lot of people complain bitterly of cramping and we tell them, but the salt won't make any difference, but it does make a difference. So, so there are things about salt that we don't understand. And it's really, it's good because if you read waterlogged, you'll see, I give all the evidence and there's plenty of evidence that you, it's impossible to become sodium deficient today. Yet, some people benefit by taking salt. So, and some people run better when they take more salt. So there are things that we don't fully understand. Now, how again, about, I, go ahead. I, again, I, it's just like we're all an experiment of one and, and we just have to experiment. And you know, follow the general rules. Mm -hmm. And then, so the general rule is that most people don't need additional salt when they're running. But some people who've got cramping will may find it beneficial. How about uh, magnesium and potassium? I think those go together with salt. So yeah. you probably want, if you are problem suffering from cramping, I certainly would advise to, to try those three. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you're on a high fat diet, because that, there's a lot of reports of people really benefiting on a high fat diet. That, and they, they clearly become salt deficient, but I bet if you tested them, you wouldn't find it, but they, they benefit from salt and potassium and magnesium. But, it, but, it's, but a general rule is you probably don't need it, but some people will benefit from it. Yeah. I mean, you also have the situation where like most of the cell, most of the potassium is inside the cell, which is sometimes it's hard to t uh, test that because you're checking the blood. You're not checking intracellular minerals. So it's kind of, um, it might not show up in the blood um, out or ex exterior to the cell. Um, yeah, sodium's the only one that really does show up in the in the bloodstream. Yeah, so um, let's touch on um, this common thing that people uh, like athletes that keep asking me. Yes, but if I lower my carbs, I'll lower my performance when I'm working out or I'm doing athletic activities. Can you touch on that? Yeah, okay. I think that we have to realize that 99.9% .9 of everyone of athletes are recreational athletes. And mm -hmm. that's the point. So when we talk about the 0.1% who are competing in the Olympics at short distances, say up to, to five or 10 kilometers, yes, I think there may well be a role for, for some carbohydrates in them. But for the recreational athletes, really, if you run a minute faster or a minute slower, it's not, that's not important. What's important is your long-term health. And what worries me is that there are a lot of athletes like myself who eat a high carbohydrate diet and then damage themselves for life. And that's the issue. So you, if you can tolerate carbohydrates and you're not insulin resistant and you're not heading towards diabetes like I was, yes, eat a little bit more carbohydrate, but you only need 200 or 250 grams a day. I mean, if you go back and read some of my early books, you'll see we were telling people to eat a kilogram of carbohydrate a day. Wow. <laughs> and that was, that was in the Tour de France. And I mean, that is, that is murder. You want to kill people, give them a kilogram of carbohydrate. Oh, my a day. God. Wow. That's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. 
so, so I think I think you'll find that today a, a, a high carbohydrate diet for a Tour de France cyclist is probably 300 grams or 350 grams. Wow. And that they are burning, most of the energy that they're burning is coming from fat. That's critically important to remember. Most of the energy when you're exercising is coming from fat, not from carbohydrate. Wow. So if you're doing an ultra marathon, for example, um, what should a person, should they eat anything in that process? That, that's a great question. And, and the answer is if you're carbohydrate adapted, you have to eat carbohydrate right. and lots of it because otherwise you're going to run into trouble. Because you see, what people don't understand is if you're carbohydrate adapted, you're metabolically crippled. And no one tells you that. You see, okay, sure, you might be able to be sprint a little bit more up one or two hills. But when it comes to the long slog over four or five hours, you've got to burn fat. And the, the well-trained elite athletes can burn 1.6, 1.8 grams of carbohydrate a minute. Whereas if you are carbohydrate adapted, you're burning 0.6 and that's it. A third, a third. Wow. And so when you've gone a couple of hours and you're into your, you've reduced your carbohydrates and now you've got to burn fat, the guy who is carbohydrate adapted has, just hasn't got the energy. And, and I think actually uh, most, most ultra distance runners, even if they're eating a higher carbohydrate diet, are probably fat adapted because they do a lot of training in a fat deplete, in a carbohydrate depleted state. Because if they wouldn't, they couldn't do what they do. Right. They, don't, un they don't understand that they are actually significantly fat adapted, okay. even though they're eating or they think they're eating a high carbohydrate diet. Fascinating. And so you, you tap out the glycogen reserve and then they hit this, sometimes they'll hit this wall, call it the bonk or something. Correct. And that's when you want to be burning fat. And then if you fat adapted, you can just carry on all day. So you, to answer your first question, if you're probably fat adapted, th you don't need to eat. I'm just rewriting law of running and I'm going back to read all the old stuff again. And one of the great runners was a chap called Arthur Newton. He really started ultra distance running he's the father of ultra distance running and i'm reading again what he used to eat and they were all eating lots of meat and very little carbohydrate and in the race so he'd have a big breakfast a big english breakfast and he'd run and halfway through the race he'd stop and he'd have a meat-based food that was what they used to eat and but but he and then they they did take some carbohydrate in but as sugar in the form of sugary drinks but that was it they didn't stop and eat bananas and potatoes and apples and things. They did have sugary drinks, usually tea with added sugar. But this, the main sustenance for them was a high protein, high fat meal before and in fact during the races. Amazing. But, and, and then I must, I and Bruce Fordyce and Bernard Rose, the three of us, we were the first to develop the goose in South Africa. And we called it. I, I didn't know that. Fordyce, Rose, and Nugs. And so we, because here we were, you know, you need all that carbohydrate. And so, and we made people take all this carbohydrate. And, and we were right in the sense that if you're carbohydrate adapted, you need it. But if you're fat adapted, you have to, you don't need it. And the irony is, all three of us are insulin resistant. All three of us got fat. All three of us now eat a high fat diet and eschew the carbohydrates. <laughs> oh my gosh, I didn't know. You, you no, were the culprit. We're the culprits. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is ironic. Um, and, and then the other question I have, um, th there's another concept of um, that if you eat too much fat, people are going to say this, well, aren't I going to increase my cholesterol? Am I going to die of a heart attack? Can you touch on that point? Yeah, well, I'm glad to s oh, you asked that question because I would encourage everyone to go to the Verta Health, V-I-R-T-A Health website. And Verda Health has just completed the first year of a two or three year study in which they fed high fat diets to diabetics. Now, okay, so diabetics are the sickest people on earth. They are given the worst diet possible. They're told to eat lots of fat and lots of protein and cut the carbs. That's a, uh, a recipe for utter disaster. You, so you guess mean, what happens? You mean, uh, you just, uh, you said low carb, you mean high carb? I, no, I mean low carb. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm just using uh, okay. Oh, okay. The reverse, the reverse. So okay. technically, according to all our knowledge, they fed. They're the most dangerous diet 
to the unhealthiest people. Okay, got it. It must be a disaster. They must all drop dead. Right. Well, of course they don't. They actually get better and 60% put their diabetes into remission. But more importantly, they measure 24 markers of cardiovascular health. 24 mask markers. 23 improved more in the high fat group than in the conventionally treated group eating the high carbohydrate diet. The only difference, only one was cholesterol, the so-called cholesterol. And cholesterol has no predictive value in heart disease anyway. You gotta look at the package. So what they showed, you take the sickest people, you give them the supposedly the most toxic diet you possibly can, and 23 of 24 markers of cardiovascular disease improve. And the only one that doesn't improve is the one that is, Im is immaterial anyway. So that, to me, that's the kind of the final answer to this, to this problem. Yes, indeed, your cholesterol may go up, but that's probably a good thing rather than a bad thing because everything else is going to improve. So we don't focus on what's not important, focus on all the other stuff which is important. Yeah, that's right. And just for people that are watching, you have to realize that your body makes cholesterol, makes I think 3,000 milligrams a day. So it's a necessary part of our physiology. We need that cellular membranes, hormones, repair, all sorts of things. Thank you. It's probably the most important chemical in the body. And wow. some idiots wanted to try and stop us making it. My great friend Zoe Harcom says, the liver makes cholesterol. It doesn't want to try to kill you. It's trying to keep you alive. That's why it's making cholesterol. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Because I do a, a lot of uh, YouTube videos and I think one of the, where I get a lot of my material is I go to the mainstream push of whatever they're pushing and I go to the exact opposite <laughs> and you're going to find the truth because everything they're promoting is, it turns out to be completely utterly wrong. So um, they give me a lot of good material to uh, educate people on in reverse. Um, and then the talks on, let's talk about insulin resistance. I think this plays in with what you just said. Yeah. Maybe you can just yeah. touch on what it is and then what, why fat will actually benefit someone as insulin resistance. Yeah. So insulin resistance to me is the natural human condition for many populations. Um, you know, that, I say that reservedly because I don't have the data to prove it. But, but I think that if you have grown, if a population has grown up eating a higher protein, high fat, lower carbohydrate diet, they'll have to be insulin resistant. And we know that mothers get more insulin resistant during pregnancy. And we knew the babies are insulin resistant. The fetus is insulin resistant when it's born. So, so it's kind of in our genes. And what's happened in the last 40 or 50 years is that we've taken mothers and we've fed, force fed them carbohydrate during their pregnancy. That makes them more insulin resistant. The fetus is born more insulin resistant. And then we wean them onto high carbohydrate diets. And that makes the child even more insulin resistant. So the high carbohydrate diets are pushing us to become more and more and more insulin resistant. What, that, what is that? You can't metabolize carbohydrates properly. So in my case, if I take carbohydrates, my glucose shoots up, my insulin shoots up, and the insulin doesn't work properly. It can't get the glucose into my tissues. So I've got less muscle glycogen, which of course is profoundly ironic because here I was telling all these fat runners to eat lots of carbohydrate and they would they couldn't get rid of the carbohydrate into the muscles they would convert it to fat so it wasn't helping them anyway so you can't metabolize the carbohydrate and the insulin doesn't work properly and it just gets worse so every time you take in carbohydrate you over secrete insulin the insulin doesn't work and it makes the system just get worse and worse and worse and the key, and you never burn fat because you're always trying to get rid of all this carbohydrate you're eating. And so any fat that you ingest has to be stored because you can't burn it because insulin prevents the burning of the fat. And then the insulin, it turns out, is toxic on almost all body tissues. So, so, so the, body, the body is trying to protect the overdose of insulin and sugar by developing insulin resistance. It's trying to tell us, hey, stop consuming so many carbohydrates. Yeah. And it, that's right, and it takes the carbohydrate and stores it fat. So initially it's okay because you just get fat, the subcutaneous tissues, but then you put a little bit of that fat in the liver or in the pancreas, and then you become even more insulin resistant, and that's when you tip over into diabetes. It's just one of those obvious things that's it's like the elephant in the room that if you lower your carbs, increase your fat. Fat has the least effect on insulin. You're going to actually help insulin resistance. And 
Um, yeah, so it's, uh, oh my gosh, it's crazy. It makes no sense that if you can't tolerate carbohydrate that you encourage to eat carbohydrate. So right. far, finally, we, the evidence is coming through that, and in fact, the first, the way people with type one diabetes, where you don't secrete any insulin, they were treated on low carbohydrate diets in the 1920s before insulin was available. And that was the only way you could get people to live any longer was not feeding them carbohydrate. But we kind of forgot that. <laughs> wow, I didn't know that. That's, a, that's interesting. Yeah, it's, like, it's, 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 wow, it's just it's, amazing. Um, what happened was then insulin came along and then the guys thought, well, we've cured the disease so you can eat what you like and we'll give you more insulin. Uh, and so then... Right. And then the other problems are that insulin drops your glucose. So doctors, the worst thing they fear is that you drop your insulin, your glucose. So they said, well, it's better to run at a higher glucose. And then there's, more, there's less danger that you'll get a hypoglycemic attack. And that's the problem because the hypoglycemia is caused by too much insulin. So they're really, they're focused on this hypoglycemia, but they're kind of ignoring the hyperinsulinemia problem, exactly. which is just as damaging as the high sugar. It's in fact, it's yeah, and it's probably, probably more. the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, um, what type of um, interesting uh, activities or research are you currently doing right now in your um, lab or your office? Yeah, I'm. So I'm retired, but we have a foundation, the Noakes Foundation, and we try to fund research in. And my interest, obviously, is in diabetes, and we're just gearing up now for a study of people who are reversing their diabetes. So over the years, we developed a laboratory where we could study pretty much the whole metabolism of the human body. And we've just added measurements of liver glucose production because that's what really goes wrong in diabetes is you overproduce glucose. So we can now essentially measure everything we need to measure in diabetic patients. So we're taking a large sample of about 40 people with diabetes and we're measuring their metabolism before we put on the intervention, which is a low carbohydrate diet. And then of that 40, we're hoping 60% will reverse. And then we'll see what has changed in that group. So then we'll understand the biology of reversal, which no one has studied yet. So we know that you can reverse. I use that word carefully because you're not really healed. You still can't eat a high carbohydrate diet. So you're in remission in a sense. So we're trying to see what happens with in remission. And we think that we will show that the liver glucose metabolism is normalized, which, which would be crucial. And then that will show, okay, so that's what's the problem in diabetes is that it's the liver glucose production gets, goes wrong. And these are the reasons why that happens. So we're doing intensive research on that. But the other thing that a lot of people ask is, well, if this low carbohydrate diet's healthy and good, but it's very expensive. And that actually is not true. So the, in South Africa, as in, in the United States, the people who've got the biggest diabetes problem are the poorest because they have the worst food choices. And we've shown that in South Africa, you can, you can live quite well on $3 a day. You can eat well on $3 a day. And we've developed diets for $3 a day. Now we're about to do a major intervention of 200 people where we put them on a $3 a day diet wow. and see what happens and the, these are people who are sick. They've got diabetes, high blood pressure. And we know that, or sorry, we know, we suspect that once you take the sugar out, because these people are completely sugar addicted and carbohydrate addicted, because that's all they can afford to, or they thought that's all they could afford. And so they've eaten those foods for, for decades. And we've, known, and we've done at least 10 interventions already, and we show the blood pressure just comes shooting down. Wow. Just like within three weeks their blood pressure start to normalize and they don't need their medications and they start to feel some in control because these are the poorest of the poor who have no control of their lives. And now we've shown them, actually, we can control your medical issues. And it's, it's absolutely eye-opening and it's so rewarding. So wow. my foundation is funding a major study like that. And then the third thing we do is we have set up a nutrition network just in since May where we're teaching doctors how to prescribe low carbohydrate diets and the, the biology of the low carbohydrate diet. And it's, it's amazing because we believe the doctors are critical. Uh, anyone in the medical profession, be it nurses, physiotherapists, whatever, they're all critical because if we can, every doctor we can convert will convert 10,000 people at least because you'll have a big patients and those patients will tell others 
And just as soon as the doctor says it's okay, then that makes a big difference. Right. So what kind of, that, uh, are they, are they, um, do you seem to find that there's interest there? Is it kind of slow? What, what, what what's well, we've had, we had, we've had a great sign up. I mean, we just completely, we expected a hundred people. We got 400 people for the first course. So, Good. so it's really been exciting. And we're now going to really expand into a, a tier two and then a tier three, which will be some sort of university diploma. Wow. And this is really exciting. It is. And the, the, it's been very, very well received. And we ha we are very appreciative of how well people have, are enjoying it. Wow. And guys, just so you know, I'm going to put some links down below uh, by Professor Noak's foundation, some of his books, and uh, you need to check this guy out. Um, one, one question I had about um, when people start to get on a ketogenic diet, they lower their carbs. Um, obviously, you're going to lower the insulin. And if they've been insulin resistant for a long time, occasionally the blood sugars, because they've been held down by the insulin, tends to go up a little bit. Um, have you have you seen that? Um, Generally, you know, I speak from a lot of experience. If you die, if you're frankly diabetic, your glucose control improves it dramatically. So, at the extremes where people have glucose is going up to 15, 18, 20 in our units, and I'm not quite sure what the American units would be, but within days they can get the glucose down to to 80, which would be normal for for the other values. But we, we talk about values of five. And so the remo it's remarkable when you take a diabetic and put them on the start. But you're quite right. There, is, there can be a small increase initially. Mm -hmm. But generally, that will, that will come, the, the glucose will start dropping in time. Wow. This is awesome. I, I want to just thank you for your time for doing this interview. And I think you shared great insights into what could be possible to improve, improve health and, and the um, kind of counterintuitive uh, viewpoints that are kind of shattering some of the, the myths out there of the mainstream. So I want to thank you for this interview and I hope to talk to you soon with some more updates. So thank you very much. My pleasure, Eric. It was lovely chatting to you. Thanks so much. Great.